So the first question is for Matt. Uh, Matt, John's book has a strong rebellious undertone, and you, you took yourself an unconventional approach in making your film. Uh, I heard that you called it a living collage. Could you please tell us a bit more about that? Sure. Um, I think from the get-go, John and I didn't want to make a kind of conventionalized historical documentary that's told from the point of view of an expert. Um, and rather than explaining this cultural history, we wanted to express it um, in a different way. And um, it kind of led us to come up with this approach, what if we tell this story from the point of view of youth? And John's book, um, which is the basis for the film, is littered with just hundreds of actual quotes from teenagers. And that became um, the material that, that helped us construct the script. Um, and early on in our process, John described something he observed um, in the 1970s when he was um, participating and writing about punk. He saw these teenagers taking thrift clothes from previous generations and cutting them up um, and reassembling them with safety pins into something that felt totally new. And he called that living collage. And I thought that was just a kind of amazing premise for filmmaking as well. And so for this film, um, we were taking these shards and um, clips of various youth movements and youth cultures, these voices, and um, re-scrambling them into this kind of new work of contemporary nonfiction. So that's kind of how we, we think of the form of the film. Great. Um, John? So you're a writer and a music journalist. Um, and among many other things, you wrote the acclaimed um, book, England's Dreaming, which is considered a, a definitive history of punk. Um, so you work together with Matt on the adaptation uh, to the screen of Teenage. When Matt first came to you, were you sold about the idea to have the book adapted to the screen, or how do you how do you feel about it? Um, well, there's one person in the room who knows all about this. This is my agent, Rachel, and we saw quite a few people. Um, we had about three or four people who we talked to from British television who shall remain nameless, and they all wanted to change it in the first meeting. And um, I'm old and obstinate and didn't want to change anything. And Matt was the first person that came along and said, right, let's do it, like the book. We're not going to make it, take it from 1945. The book ends in 1945. We're not going to take it from 1945 to the present day. We're just going to try and do the book. And I always thought also that I wanted it to be made by a younger director in this case, and also, which Matt is, thank you, and also that I wanted it to be produced and ideally funded in America, which is in fact what happened. The film was totally funded by Cine Reach from New York, and Matt is obviously an American director who works and lives in New York, and that's exactly what I wanted, because at root the story is an American story, and I also had the instinct, which Matt and I confirmed fairly early on. One of the first things we did was look through, was it about 90 hours of footage? an amazing amount of footage, and we actually realized that we had a film because we had enough footage to actually cover what we wanted to say. And it was extraordinary the amount of youth-related footage that was available, particularly in the war years, but also in the 30s and to a lesser extent the 20s. And nobody had ever looked. I've seen hundreds of documentaries on the topic because I'm fascinated by it. And, um, and I'm fascinated by documentary film. And the material was there. It's just pe people hadn't thought to look for it. I don't feel comfortable speculating about what um, contemporary youth's kind of dilemmas or passions are today. In fact, I feel like that's the domain of the marketers and market researchers. If anything, I think what I learned from this film is observing some kind of um, universal patterns and that young people um, are hardwired to kind of rebel against their parents' generation, and their parents' generation um, are determined to control youth. And um, within that dialectic, there is um, kind of teenage rebellion, and it's often dismissed as this kind of emotional rite of passage. But that, um, as you can see in the material of the film, we, we really believe that there is a kind of political and social substance um, and cultural substance to that rebellion. And so um, I believe in, in the now, um, that that dynamic is, is creating a kind of progress, in a sense. It's a question for both of you, but is there, in today's youth culture, a trend that you're closely following and you find is really influential? Um, 
I, I I always answer this in a general sense because um, I'm an, I'm now I've just turned sixty, so I don't think even I can think of myself as youthful. So uh, I really am not the person to ask about contemporary youth trends, but. Um, I do think, extrapolating from my own experience, and also I do actually talk to, to people who are about 18, 19, 20, and when you're 18, 19, and 20, you're, you come out, you're merging into a world, you're merging out of your peer world. The first distinguishing you make is you, you move out of your parents' world into the peer world, and then you move out of the peer world into the world, the wider world. And when you come out into the world, and it's an incredibly powerful moment because you can see what's wrong with the world, and you're trying to fit into it, and it's really hard. Your late teens and early 20s are really hard in that respect. And you can see what's wrong, and, um, and you want to try, make, try to make it better for yourself, and maybe for other people as well. There's an idealism at that stage, and also energy, and also a desire to see change because you've got to live with it. If you're unhappy with things, it's up to you to change it to some extent. So I think, and also youth are very pragmatic compared to you know now, um, you know I can look at the world and say, oh my God, I wouldn't like to be young now. But that's completely irrelevant because when you're 19, 20, you don't know anything different. Um, and what I do get from, the, I, funnily enough, watching the film, I watched it a hundred times. We went through all the subject matter. We went through about 20, 20, 30 edits. And what I noticed in the film tonight, a pattern, is of all these young, smiling, energetic faces and just that energy um, of youth, which is extraordinary. And that in itself, quite apart from the social importance that, and the projections that adults place on youth, is incredibly important. Yeah, that's uh, something I've done before in my filmmaking is I make kind of fake archival footage. And um, I knew that this film would have a kind of panoramic kind of intellectual quality to it. Um, you know, a lot of material, but I wanted it to have a strong emotional basis. And I thought the way to do that is by bringing out characters. And these kind of mini biographies or hidden histories or, or hidden biographies are in John's book. And they were one of my favorite features of the book. And so... Um, I chose to focus on four different characters, and together they form a kind of composite portrait of the teenager that was about to emerge. And um, I favor recreations um, that look like actual um, found artifacts from the given period. So I worked with the cinematographer to figure out non-digital, non-special effects means to degrade 16 millimeter footage to look like actual home movies or newsreels from these periods, and rather than just using that device kind of liberally throughout the film, I chose to use that device to bring out the stories of these characters, who are, are fairly obscure figures. There are There is no footage of any of them. There's maybe two or three photographs of Brenda Dean Paul. So it really was necessary to resort to creative filmmaking to bring their stories to life, and I think they they kind of deepen the, um, the themes of the film in a way. Um, also, sorry, also when looking at the footage, a lot, obviously a lot of the footage is actually um, from the point of, if, if you listen to the voiceover, I mean, I, you know, some of the voiceover is actually really funny, and some of the fictionalized stuff, particularly near the end of the American adolescence, is also super corny. And what you're actually, you know, are you pregnant, all that stuff. And um, the, a, lot of the, a lot of the footage that exists of adolescence and um, young people is obviously told from the point of view of adults. So in order to get the dialectic in the film between the voice of adults and the voice of adolescents, we number one had to use direct quotes and number two had to find some way of showing that experience and so that's another really important thing that we agreed ab about the reconstructions. The script is a kind of is a collage of direct quotes, modified direct quotes, and then some original scripted material to create a coherent narrative. So there's there's some interpretation in there as well. I would say that of the reconstructions, a very large proportion are direct quotes, particularly in the four reconstructions. The Warren Wall quote is actually from a wonderful book called Negro Youth at the Crossways. The Brenda Dean Paul quotes are from a book called My First Life, which is her autobiography. Um, the Melissa Mashman quotes are from her autobiography, which is called Account Rendered, which is a, a wonderful book. Who's the last one? Uh, 
Tommy Shields. Oh, Tommy Shields, yes. And, and that was, um, it was harder to find direct quotes, but that was telling the story, um, which has been well told in a couple of books about the Hamburg Swings. So whenever possible, I mean, obviously there are linking devices, but we wanted, you know, this is the way of getting the voice of young people over, is to have these direct quotes. Well, I'm sort of of the belief that America's great gift to the world is black American music and all that's followed ever since. So that's the basic starting point. Um, obviously, in the book, music is very important because obviously music is um, one of the ways in which American culture has spread, right, going back from to ragtime in the early years of the 20th century and the way that ragtime actually percolated over to the UK in around, I can't remember, it was 1910, there was a famous hit show called Hello Ragtime. So you have the start of that 20th century pattern. And um, I mean, I love the music. I mean, a lot of the music in, the f actually the music in the film was the stuff I gave Matt, what, did I give you a hard drive or a CD? Uh, I gave Matt a hard drive of electronic and ambient stuff that I dislike listening to anyway. And some of that actually remains in the film. There's a bit of Noy, there's a bit of Michael Rother, there's a bit of Bruce Gilbert. And then um, Matt, Matt had the idea of getting Bradford Cox to do uh, the footage. And we did try, in an early version of the film, we did actually have, it got cut out quite late, we actually had a bit of the original Dixieland jazz band. And we went back and forwards about this. And we actually had a bit of the original Dixieland, which is the first jazz million seller in 1917 and coincided with America's entry into the First World War. And we played the record, and it sounded dreadful. Yeah, I think just in the filmmaking style as well, um, the concept was always to combine this vintage dated material with contemporary music, and that, as a device, always felt totally transformative to me. And uh, a lot of people don't know, but um, almost all the footage in the film uh, is silent. Um, I would say the vast majority of it is silent, unless you hear newsreel voiceover. So, uh, the entire sound experience of the film is designed or covered by music, and um, early on I, I, I approached Bradford um, because I felt his aesthetic would work well with this material. And, and obviously, I mean, in the, in the film, th there are two huge moments of release for me, one of which is swing, um, that segue when you go into um, Gene Krupa um, banging the crap out of the drums and sing, sing, sing and also the Frank Sinatra moment, which I I'm, I'm really like the way that it's done because you don't actually hear Frank Sinatra sing, you just see the crowd going crazy. And, and there you have it. I mean, obviously music, and particularly its effect on young female fans is basically the birth of what we would now consider to be pop culture. I think the whole premise of this film is to uncover hidden histories rather than material that's already familiar. So we have seen and heard about the punks and the hippies and the skaters and the beatniks and the rockers. And um, what was fascinating to me about John's book and fascinating about the material we were able to uncover is that um, I've never seen it before. Many people have never seen this material before. Um, and we also thought this premise of a prehistory was a kind of a different approach to looking at the past and how it might inform the present rather than literally explaining um, how, why teenagers are influential today. Um, the film leaves a lot of interpretive um, possibilities to you as, as the viewers to look at how the uh, origins and birth of youth culture um, resonates today.